Uh, good morning, everybody. That's good, nice and loud. Um, I think I've heard before that if you're going to, say, a dinner party or something, there's two main topics you want to avoid, and that is, uh, if you know what they are, uh, you don't talk about religion and you don't talk about politics. And nowadays, uh, I think you might add to that list uh, COVID, and you could also add finances. You'd have to be relatively crazy to talk about religion, politics, COVID, and finances all in the same, say, half-hour span. So <laughs> I'm going to see if I can go four for four uh, here today. <clears throat> uh, I figure I'll start with religion, since that's probably my safest bet, uh, since y'all are <laughs> here in church. Uh, back in the fall, we set out a course that I, I kind of described this upcoming year as something like the year of Jesus. And the idea there was this idea that we wanted to really invest. If we're Christians, we want to invest in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and in getting to know him. And we started out by, uh, you might say walking, or maybe a better word would be running, through the Old Testament and kind of looking at all those stories as they led up to and reached their fulfillment in Jesus and then about Christmas time, I sort of drug that $5 bill in front of you and said, you know, uh, eventually we'll get to, and then we, we, we did, the birth of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so our question then becomes sort of like, <laughs> what do we do next, right? What, what's next? Uh, before I answer that question, uh, I would like to ask you all some questions. Uh, this is a bit of audience participation, so feel free to speak out loud in church. It's, it's permitted, trust me. So I got some pictures up here I want to show you, and I want you to tell me if you can tell from the picture, it's a little grainy, but if you can tell from the picture who that is. Any, any ideas? Abraham. Very good. Okay. How about the next one? Joseph. Joseph. Okay. Okay. Uh, Joseph in the coat of many colors, right? Next. Uh, Moses. It's, it's, like either, it's either Charlton Heston or it's Moses, but this is, <laughs> this is Moses. Okay. So Moses. Uh, how about the next one? Jesus, okay, and I think that picture, uh, it was either like a church I, I had been at before or maybe in my grandmother's house or something. That's like a pretty familiar picture, I think, that a lot of us have probably seen before of Jesus. Uh, how about the last one? <laughs> we got John the Baptist. We got something about the History Channel over here. Anybody else? Uh, Peter, okay, we got Peter. Um, let me explain this picture. This is actually not a biblical figure precisely, so uh, if you didn't know that, then rest easy, you're fine. Um, this picture is uh, a, an amalgamation. So there's an anthropologist uh, about 15 years ago or so who was studying uh, people who lived in the first century, say, Jesus' era. And what he did is he took the skulls of three Jewish men from that time period and kind of uh, melded them together, and then tried to reconstruct the image of the face of that person, so that, that historic first century Jewish man. Um, so here's my point. The guess is that this picture here probably looks a lot more like the actual Jesus than the picture that was on right before that, that everybody easily and quickly knew as Jesus. Here's another interesting question, I think. How tall, how tall do you think Jesus was? Any, any, any guesses, any assumptions of how tall? So I did, I did some research, and uh, most folks think somewhere in the realm of five foot one to five foot five. So five one to five five, the height of Jesus. Uh, now, you may ask the question, realistically, like, why am I showing you this picture that we think might look something like Jesus and talking about how tall he is? What's the point of all that? Here, here's why. I think uh, as we come into our next stage of investing and, and trying to learn and figure out, you know, what is Jesus really like, we can oftentimes come into that with some set of our expectations or our experiences that might not be exactly accurate. And so I hope that as we go through our next, uh, our next phase of kind of looking into the person of Jesus, we can maybe be open to having some fresh understanding of what that looks like. Here, here's maybe a better way to say that. I think that not only can we have a mental image of what we think Jesus looks like, but we can also kind of create his personality, his actions, 
to be maybe in the way that we would want him to be instead of the way that he actually was and actually is. And so, you know, we might love and hold on to a verse that says, you know, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And it's like, yeah, give me more of that, you know. But we don't want to necessarily look at the whole of who the person of Jesus really was and is. And so uh, my hope is that um, in this next um, sermon series, we get a chance to kind of look at Jesus in a way that I hope is, is biblically sound and accurate, but might refresh us or change, you know, some of our preconceived uh, experiences or, or ideas. Here's a slight example of what I'm talking about. Did you ever think about the question of whether or not Jesus was brilliant? Like, in other words, was he as intellectually capable as the smartest people that we ever interact with? Like, was, was he really, really, really smart in his day and, and, and even now? I'm not going to answer that question today, but that's the kind of thing that I want us to think about as we go through this next uh, series. H- how are we going to do it? What we're going to do is we're going to go specifically through uh, the book of Matthew. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> we just don't have the time to go as much as I was very tempted to do it, to go verse by verse through the whole entire thing. Um, but that would probably take us not till this Easter, but the following. So um, we're going to go through the book of Matthew relatively in chronological order. You, you didn't necessarily even know this, but we actually started last week uh, when Pastor Chris came and shared such a helpful uh, situation on the temptation of Jesus. That was from Matthew chapter 4. Um, why did we pick the book of Matthew? Why, why did we choose that? Uh, the book of Matthew starts, verse 1 starts by saying, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, Matthew's a cool book because it's written by a Jewish, uh, a Jewish man, Matthew the tax collector, to a Jewish audience. And because of that, uh, Matthew is going to bring in a lot of the themes of the Old Testament. Even in the introduction, he goes back in the genealogy to Abraham. In other words, he's saying that, that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. This is a particularly Jewish book to a Jewish audience. And so uh, that's going to be, be helpful for us uh, for a couple reasons. One is we've been talking about the Old Testament as it points to the New Testament, and now we're going to talk about the book of Matthew, and it's going to link us back to the Old Testament and continue to tie everything together. The second thing is that the book of Matthew is written to the spiritual people of that day. And since I have the opportunity to t- talk to people in a church who are, you know, theoretically the spiritual people who are seeking to understand and know about and relate to God, uh, I think that the particular ways that that book talks to spiritual people can be helpful to us uh, here, I, I-, I hope. Here's another way to think about how the next uh, three months of our time, basically like uh, January, February, March into April, uh, can be helpful. Since the creation of the world, uh, everybody agrees that there have been billions and billions of humans that have lived on Earth. Billions of humans. There's like seven billion now, but but billions over time, all of history. Out of all of those billions, (laughs) one of those people was the person Jesus of Nazareth. There's, there's no question about that. You, you know, secular, religious scholars, everyone agrees Jesus was a person, right? Um, Jesus lived for about 33 years. Everyone seems to agree, 33 years of life, of which only the last three were what we usually de- uh, describe as his time of ministry. And in the four Gospels, what we have are enough events, uh, enough stories about Jesus' life that might make up, say, three months' time period of his three years of ministry, of his 33 years of life. You you follow me? Now, what's fascinating is that out of all the billions of people who have lived on earth, not one person has made such a huge influence on humankind on earth as Jesus did in the three months of of the stories and, and the three years of ministry, 33 years of life that we know him of. And so I feel like I feel very strongly about this, that in the midst of the craziness of the world that we're all in here, starting into, stepping into 2021, in the midst of all that, it seems like it'd be helpful for us to focus on that one person out of all the billions who who, who has been most influential over all time. Um, So we're going to do that. Uh, I'm going to start next week. Uh, We're going to jump into the Beatitudes. We'll spend basically the rest of January in the Sermon on the Mount. That's Matthew 5 to 7. Uh, I found a practice helpful in the past for me of just reading and reading and reading through the Sermon on the Mount. So if you wanted to kind of join us in that, feel free. Um, 
but I don't want this to only be uh, a year where it's like me kind of <laughs> yammering on up here for half an hour every Sunday to you, and that's kind of your whole scope of how you're, you're seeing and learning about Jesus. So I'm going to ask you today to do another thing, which is uh, if you have a calendar, like a, a written calendar or one on your phone or whatever, I want you to mark down an important date for our church, uh, which is uh, ironically April 15th. So you can, if you want to also say tax day in there, you can. That's not what I'm, why I'm doing that at all. But tax day, April 15th, uh, I want you to put that date in your calendar, and here's, here's why. Thank you. I see some people doing it now. Um, I can't see you if you're home doing this, but hopefully you are too. Um, here's why. So I, I'm a math geek. Everyone knows that. And uh, so I did the math, and there are 260 chapters in the New Testament, 260 total chapters. And so working backwards... If we start reading the New Testament on April 16th, April 16th, that's actually the day after tax day, uh, if we read one chapter a day to collectively as a church, we will get through reading the entire New Testament before 2021 is over. Why do I feel that that's like a, a compelling thing that we need to do? I, I hesitate sometimes to say like, you know, the Lord told me this is exactly what we need to do, that kind of thing, but I, I feel very, very strongly that we need to be together collectively reading the word because I feel like that's going to be the, the sure foundation, <laughs> the sure foundation. And I want to do that together. And so you might say, well, Pastor Luke, why don't we just start that now, right? Like, why don't we just start? It's January. It's, there's three reasons I didn't want to start it now. Let me explain them, them here. Number one is I'd like to go through the series on kind of the book of Matthew so that April 16th, we jump in and we're reading in a way that's reviewing and refreshing in our brains, because I think that repetition is really helpful. I'm a teacher at heart, so I know that repetition is helpful to keep those thoughts in our brains correctly. So that's number one, repetition. Um, number two is <laughs> I want to avoid the time that we might all be in right about now, which is uh, it's January 10th, so I'm guessing that at least some of us have these awesome New Year's uh, resolutions and then, you know, 10 days in or, you know, however many days in, it's like that kind of goes by the wayside. I didn't want to start it in that kind of a, uh, if we, I think sometimes people are ironically in the habit of starting and then losing New Year's resolutions. And I want to avoid that habit. Uh, number three is I really want folks to have some time to get excited about this. So I'm vis envisioning something like a couple hundred people all reading through the New Testament together and then, and then uh, kind of getting to know Jesus and all the things that, that we can learn and grow together through the New Testament, through reading that uh, on a daily basis. And so if we do one, one chapter a day starting April 16th, I think that might, might be able to happen. Okay, so I, I said at the beginning, four topics. I've been through one now. That's religion. It's like kind of really, really simple. Like we're going to invest in learning about Jesus, but I think it's also like the most profound thing we could probably be doing right about now. Uh, I still have to cover... COVID, politics, and money. So I'm going to jump in and try to do uh, COVID and a touch of politics uh, in here next, okay? Five months ago, it was uh, early August, and uh, Pastor Doug retired, if you can remember back to that space, uh, August 2nd. And then uh, my first sermon standing up here to our church, August 9th, I preached on COVID. And uh, I used the passage from Romans 14 uh, to do so. And so I'm not going to repeat everything that I said in that sermon now. Uh, it's, on, it's on the internet, so we have that thing now. So if you want to go back and re-see it or whatever, it's August 9th of 2020 was that, that sermon. Um, Two weeks, I think, after that sermon, we learned of our first COVID case uh, within someone connected to our church. And uh, since then, I generally keep track. I have an Excel spreadsheet of people that I know that have or currently have COVID. And I think we're up to something around the 50 people mark that are people connected to our church with COVID. Um, and I, I get that this is not the most uh, joyous topic, like here we are, it's a new year, can you please stop talking about this kind of thing? But um, I get that it's not the most joyous topic, but here's, here's my philosophy on this. I think part of the job of a leader is to kind of define the reality for people, to not avoid the controversial or the, the um, complex thing, but like bring it up and talk about it so that we can go through it to where we need to go instead of just be, everyone's kind of confused what's happening about all this. So 
uh, <clears throat> right now, when COVID has gone from kind of this, back in August when I first preached one of this theoretical thing, to now this practical thing that's like actually we can see is happening around us, I thought it's important to revisit that now. So let me describe the situation. Like I said, there's 50 or so folks from our church who have you know, had or, or, and, or currently have COVID. Uh, some of them very, very uh, sick, hospitalizations, all that stuff. You guys probably get the email so you know about a lot of that. Um, not only that, but it's also affected our community. Um, my neighbor uh, behind my house is Vin Vince Inzarello. He just passed away uh, not too long ago uh, from COVID complications. Um, as you've heard, uh, 50 or so deaths from Valley View. Um, Lee, Lee and M. Bonner here, and, and just the idea of the funeral situation in Mifflin County. I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm trying to accurately describe what's really going on. And so there's that, that health side that's, that is really impacting real people's lives. There's also kind of this other perspective on the whole thing, which is that schools have been canceled for quite a while. Uh, a lot of restaurants have struggled to, you know, um, financially and that sort of thing. Um, even in church, I think often about <laughs> the days before COVID, when at 10 o'clock on a Sunday, you could count on 200 or more people gathering here. And uh, now we have, you know, however many here here for the first service and the second service and people watching online views and all that kind of stuff. And so I think um, the situation of Keith Cram is kind of uh, il illustrative for me of kind of where we might be as a church. And so Keith and Jody used to be like the first people here every Sunday, Sunday school, church, that sort of thing. Um, he is currently uh, mandatory working at the, at the prison every Sunday and has been from December into January. Um, and Keith used to always tell me, and I take... I take no personal offense at this, but he used to always tell me that by far his favorite part of church was what he called, and, and you got to know Keith, he called uh, hug and howdy time, which the rest of us like regular people, we just call like church greeting time. And uh, so Keith said that was like by far the best. You hug people, you greet, you shake hands, all that kind of thing. And we have not experienced that together as a whole church body in coming up on a year, right? So there's like a reality to, to um, the the physical health part of it, there's also a rea reality to the emotional health, the financial health, all those kinds of things. And so uh, I've heard more this week about people who are struggling with loneliness, struggling with, you know, kind of the isolation and that sort of thing uh, than I had up to this point through, through COVID. And so five months ago, uh, I, I used the Romans 14 passage to describe the pathway that we were going to take through COVID that was, I think, uh, not to focus on one extreme view or the other extreme view of this, but to kind of create a complex path that went sort of through the middle a little bit better than that. And so what that basically consisted of was to provide options for people and to know that every individual is different and their context and their situation is different. And so some people uh, either have significant health issues or work with people with significant health issues, and if they uh, can view online, and you're <laughs> viewing this now, we love you, and we don't think like anything, like you're not a good human being or, or whatever kind of a thing, uh, and we want to make sure we're conveying that. For other people who say, you know, the, the connection to people and the chance to be here together and worship in, physically in this place is helpful, and I'm willing to take the level of risk required to come to the first or the second service, then by all means, we want to provide that opportunity for, for everybody. And so the verse that I kind of centered that on was um, from Romans uh, chapter 14, verse 13, it says, therefore, let us not pass judgment, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide not to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. And so it's kind of like this, se this sense of we want to love each other, even in some of our differences in how we're, we're responding to, to COVID. Um, <clears throat> God, I said in that sermon, God, God will judge people's hearts. We don't need to be the kind of end-all, be-all judge of what, why everyone's doing the things that they're doing, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I think we could all probably agree at this point uh, that politics has kind of created even more extreme divisiveness as it relates to and kind of based on the situation with covid and so uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, but I, I do want to say that um, I, I feel so strongly, and I said this back in that sermon, I think, or around then, and I say it again now, that 
Christ is the one who is the, the king of the universe, who is on the throne. And if we get kind of this false assumption that our savior is going to come through the political situations of this world, then we can really get wrapped up in, in, a, in a false sense of how, um, who really is in ultimate control of, of where we're at. So I'll just, I'll just say that for now. Um, all right, la- last thing about COVID kind of politics is uh, back in that sermon uh, five months ago, I mentioned five guiding principles that I thought would lead us forward through kind of how we responded to COVID. And does anyone here remember those five principles? And if you're giving me blank stares, that's no worries at all because I re-looked them up for my sermon from five m- months ago because I forgot them myself, so no worries. Um, but I want to just briefly touch on those five things because I think like I said earlier, as it became a theoretical thing to a practical thing, it's worth investing uh, back in those things. So number one is a Christ-centered focus. And so I feel like we've been trying to do that through the Old Testament uh, sermon series, and we're going to really try to do that in, in Jesus and Matthew, this, this next sermon series. Number two is communication. Uh, at the risk of kind of losing a Sunday where I'm not preaching specifically about a passage and that sort of thing, uh, I really want, think it's valuable to communicate to, to our folks to say, here's where we're at on this kind of stuff, kind of reset a new year, uh, kind of communicate where we're all at together. Number three uh, was engagement, not attendance. Engagement, not attendance. Now, (laughs) trust me, I could go on for like hours about this thing, uh, and I I will not right now, uh, but instead what I'd like to do is give a couple examples of what I mean. Uh, What I mean by engagement, not attendance, is that we are not going to be a church who's going to be focused on like getting as many people to sit in our pews or getting as many views on live stream because I don't think that that's the main concern uh, of God. And so at the end of the book of Matthew, which <laughs> we're not there yet, but at the end of the book of Matthew uh, is the great commission. It's the, the great co-mission, like our mission together, the co-mission. And that is to go into all the world and make disciples. And so our mission is to do that, and I want people to be engaged in that mission. And so that might look like uh, you're involved in, say, our prayer chain situation. That might look like uh, there's um, Rebecca Leonard helps us to edit videos from home to kind of help with our YouTube channel. And and so there's a million ways to be engaged in the mission. And it also means that people who show up and do sit in the pew ought to also be engaged in the mission. You can't check the church box by saying, I showed up, I sat there, I listened to Pastor Luke Yammer on for a half an hour, so don't I deserve... We all got to be engaged in the mission. The mission is big enough to require all hands on deck. That's what I mean by this this, uh, point. Number four is mourn our losses and seek joy in the future. Mourn our losses and seek joy in the future. And so I actually got a a letter from my brother-in-law over Christmas. And his letter said, uh, he just encouraged me to really try to lead the church with joy. Uh, Because that's infectious and helpful just about the same time that we're in a crisis. And so... I don't mean that we're going to be a church that's going to be surface level, just having fun, goofing off all the time, but to mourn our losses, to really like cry over things, like Christians should be crying and also crying with laughter, I think. Not, you know, just kind of surface level going through the world with no, you know, emotion free, that that sort of thing. And so uh, in that same passage in Romans 14, it actually says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so uh, the irony of the sentence is, is not lost on me, but I'm very, very serious, very serious about our need to seek joy. In other words, we might have to like work hard at that. We might have to plan times to actually laugh, to actually enjoy each other, to have fun, to smile, all that kind of stuff, especially as the winter drags on, as COVID, all this stuff, political craziness. Like, we need to find a place to say we have joy in the Holy Spirit and we can be a, a, a counterexample to the rest of the world as, as Christ's bride, his church here. Um, the last, uh, the fifth thing is pray, pray, pray. <clears throat> in this area, uh, I would like to um, give sort of a pastoral kick in the behind. A pastoral kick in the behind. Um, here, here's why. For about uh, three or four months now, we've been meeting uh, on the third Tuesday of every month to, at 6.30 to pray, and uh, there's been some of us here. There's also been, I know there's some folks who are praying from home and they're concerned because of COVID. I completely get that, but at max, there's been, I think, four individuals here praying for our church, 
And so if you know me, you know I'm not the kind of like pushy, super in your face, you know, that kind of, I don't have that kind of personality, but I'm going sort of outside of that personality right now to say, I really think if, <clears throat> the best way to say it is this probably, if we trust that Jesus is the best help to our current situation in our church, in our community, in our world, then it seems like we ought to be getting together to ask him to help us. Like that just seems like a, a natural thing to do. And so kind of a, a pastoral kick in the butt um, it's a verse you, you, you probably all have heard a lot of times before, but 2 Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people, who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. And there's this collective sense of that, like if my people, like together, uh, can do this. And so I think there's a really important we in that. And so I want to just encourage us, uh, we'll be praying uh, the third Tuesday of this month, so not this Tuesday, but the next one uh, at 6.30 here. And again, if it's COVID situation, you want to pray from home or whatever, like completely get that. I'm not saying that kind of thing. I'm just saying we need to be praying kind of people. There's also going to be another opportunity to pray for schools coming up uh, in, in next Sunday, stuff like that. So just, I feel really strongly about that. I don't know how else to say it. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, um, where are we at? Let's, let's re recheck. So I talked about religion, kind of center on Christ. I talked about COVID with a touch of politics. Uh, last one is money. Last one is money. And so here's maybe the place where you think, oh, here he's going to ask us for more money or something like that. Um, but actually, it's the complete opposite of that. The complete opposite of that. In fact, uh, I wanted to go out of this sermon. I realize I'm challenging in a couple areas, I think. I wanted to go out on a positive note. And this is a tremendous uh, positive note. Um, I sometimes wonder, actually, actually, I very often wonder kind of where are we at with this church? Like I've been leading as a pastor here for five months and it's kind of like, what is happening with our church folks? Because I can't see everybody on every Sunday, you know, your eyes and kind of know everybody where they're at, that kind of thing. And so um, one area that we can look to uh, for just kind of like a input into where we're at, not that it's the end all be all, is kind of where we're at with money. And so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm enormously grateful, I don't, I don't know how else to say it, enormously grateful for how generous our folks have been uh, at, at Kish. And so if you go through this past year, we paid off our mortgage, uh, we put a new like twenty-some thousand dollar roof on this building, uh, y'all helped to pay for two pastors kind of overlapping between myself and PD, uh, we have a couple more building upgrade kind of things in the works. And after all of that, uh, we still have something around $100,000 in the bank, and we have a uh, Christmas offering was about 5,000 bucks. And so I say that to say thanks, and I 100% I, I realize the risk of standing up here and saying, hey, we have a whole bunch of money to people who generally are giving money to the church. I get that. Here's why I'm bringing it up, though. I'm taking that risk because I, I think it's this important. Um, like I've tried to say through a couple of different parts of this talk here, sermon, whatever, I'm about engaging in the mission to reach out with God's love to people who don't yet know about Jesus. And so I'm asking for your help right now, and here, here's how. I don't want to spend all of our money on our building. I don't want to spend all of our money on, you know, just keeping what we have going here and getting a bunch of people to sit in seats and watch on live stream and that sort of thing. I want to reach out with that money to love and care for the people who don't really know about Jesus around here. And so I'm asking for your help in that because I want to, I could sit down and think for like three days of what I think are some ways that we could spend money to help reach people for Jesus. But that's one person out of, you know, 300 or however many, you know, will hear this. And so I'm asking you if you have an idea for how we could spend some money uh, in a creative, cool, interesting, COVID, you know, world kind of a way that would be helpful. Uh, to reach out and to love people, then please email me, phone call, smoke signal, like whatever you got to do, get me that information because we want to be that kind of a church. Um, of course, you know, every, if everyone gives a million dollars worth of ideas, we can't do every idea, we have to go through the proper channels, all that kind of stuff. I think you all get that. But the point is, and, and here's why, I don't I also don't want to be the kind of church who's just throwing money at problems. Like, oh, these people have issues. Let's just give money to that, 
problem and we'll solve it and we can come here and be happy and feel like we did the good thing. That, that's not it either. What it really is, is creating people whose hearts are stirred to turn towards and care about those who are, are um, not in as good of a situation as us or don't know Jesus like we do. And so in, in asking you, I'm kind of like secretly trying to say, let's stir up more of a movement towards reaching out in that kind of love to care for people uh, so that we're also doing it, you know, so that we're actually inter interacting and relating and reaching out uh, it with our lives and our money and all of us to people who don't know about Jesus yet. So um, I, I'm done. I, I just want to pray, uh, pray especially for that one. Uh, but I want to thank you. I, I, I feel like... Um, it's been good. I th thought this was a really important time for a reset. Uh, if you have any communication based on what I said today, please feel free to, to reach out, be in touch. Uh, let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are generous, an, an amazingly and awesomely generous God who um, did not withhold your son, but if you, if you gave him, you're, you're also going to be generous in all things, and that we can be thankful that we have an an infinite God with infinite resources to reach out and love and care for us. And I pray that we would not become stingy about that, that we wouldn't become uh, the kind of people who uh, were blessed, so we're happy and we're content to kind of sit uh, where we are and, and not change or not be motivated, but that your blessing to us, we would use to reach out and be a blessing to others. I pray that you give us eyes to see the needs around us, to see people who are suffering, to think creatively and... Um, uh, with, with enthusiasm towards how we could be a, a church uh, here at Kish who is um, particularly uh, desiring to, to love others. I pray this all in your name. Amen.